Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Florian Kretz, and I'm talking to you about EDOF efficiency, truths in a confusing nomenclature. Here are my financial disclosures. I'm a consultant for Teleon. The trends in 2021 are pretty similar to 2020. It's enhanced deaths of focus IOLs, monofocal plus mono EDOFs. There's a lot on the market. And we're going to take a little bit of a closer look and going to compare the IC Boo from Johnson Johnson, the Vivity from Alcon to the renowned models Comfort MF15 and Aconex Mario with a plus 1.5 add as a rotational asymmetric IOL from Teleon. If you look at the iHands, the iHands design offers a central EDOF zone with around one diopter at power. If we compare it to the Comfort, the Comfort offers better overall defocus capacity because it has a higher add power, closer usable intermediate vision, and it's less pupil dependent. If you look a little bit at the defocus curves from Johnson Johnson, you can see the benefits of the iHands, EDOF until around 80 centimeter max compared to the monofocal. So it can be an improvement, but it does work with spherical aberration, so it's also dependent on the corneal spherical aberration. While with a Comfort IOL, you have the true defocus, it's aspheric neutral optics with plus 1.5 at giving you a very good defocus from distance to intermediate around 70, sometimes even 50 to 60 centimeters. A newer model is the Vivity. The Vivity compared to the monofocal Essence 60 WF uh, shows an elongated focal point. This happens because the central focus is a little bit uh, put to the front around two microns, and it also works with an aberration modification that increases the depth of focus. A little bit less for the distance vision, but giving it a longer focal for, to 66, around 40 centimeters. If we compare that to the comfort data of Dr. Oshika, you can see that the comfort gives an even more stable visual acuity for intermediate down to further near vision. It has a good defocus capacity, a better intermediate vision than the Vivity, and also it's less pupil dependent because it's rotational asymmetric. We have evaluated the comfort and the Aconix Vario for a long time. You can see here our data compared to a monofocal you can see there's no real difference between the rotational asymmetric design for this photopsia. And if you make a real comparison, looking at the cataract patients before surgery and the monofocal patients in that group, you can really see there's no difference for this photopsia with the MF15 compared to a standard monofocal IOR. So in conclusion, you can see here the defocus curve, which is also elongated focus, and these patients were over 72 years old. So in conclusion, the Lancet Comfort IOL shows similar to less dysphotopic phenomena compared to a monofocal. The rotational asymmetric optics shows better near intermediate values compared to mini EDOF IOLs. They're less pupil dependent. And so far, there are no rotational asymmetric disadvantages found for those IOLs compared to mono EDOFs. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Come on. Thank you. So I've, I've now heard a new word again. It's mini EDOFs. That's <laughs> that's <laughs> <not true>. <laughs> <laughs> makes things even more difficult. <laughs> so any comments or questions? So Florian, is it mo monofocal plus lens, lens is comfort, or is it uh, an EDOF lens? Or to be honest, I don't like this. I don't like this nomenclature with monofocal plus an EDOF. It's a rotational asymmet uh, asymmetric lens with a plus 1.5 at that basically gives you vision until around 60 centimeters. And it can give you a bit more if you ha have a higher spherical aberration in the cornea and a bit less if your cornea is more neutral. I think the physical properties are much more important than making mini, mono, plus. It gets too confusing for me otherwise with what is EDOF and what is not EDOF anymore or could be. Yeah, there, there is actually a clear uh, guideline for EDOF, at least for the ANSI uh, criteria in the US, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending. But I, I, I agree with everybody that it becomes even more complicated now because we have all these different words. Gerd. You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I don't really think it's so complicated because the uh, comfort lens is on the market for over 10 years and it was developed as a low ad bifocal uh, lens uh, um, covering the intermediate range. 
And uh, I think Florian is completely right. With this uh, system as a refractive lens, uh, and also only the segmental uh, area having the near edition, it really has almost no side effects and has exactly targeted that area. And if you do the, you can call it whatever you want, blinded, uh, bl blended vision or uh, monovision, uh, you can also get a very good near uh, acuity to create a, I, I, would, I call it a binocular trifocality. Yeah, I mean, uh, Detlef Breyer used this for his uh, Düsseldorf formula, as he called it, and so on. So with this kind of tool, you can also do more or less the same thing that uh, we just heard from uh, Mieland, uh, combining uh, the lenses to get uh, binocular uh, uh, spectacle independence. Yeah, Arthur? Thanks, Thomas. I, I agree with Oliver that the con you know, the terminology is so diverse now it becomes confusing. And I think what's going to be really helpful over time, and it'll happen, is that we're going to eventually have a, a, a bank of IOL studies from across different, you know, different investigators that will tell us for this particular lens, we get this range of vision afterwards with this level of dysphotopsia. And I think eventually the only thing that surgeons will be interested in is what is the compromise I'm making? If I use this particular lens with this offset, what will I get and what's the dysphotopsia? And I think we need that sort of a, a classification. How much dysphotopsia versus how much do I get in return um, rather than all the names? Philomena. I think you need a vision simulator where you put in the optical properties of the patient because we have all the data from the cornea, axial lengths, and then you just like click through all the lenses that are available and they show you exactly by ray tracing or uh, any other simulation how the patient will see in different distances which side effects are dependent on the optic of the lens and which are dependent on the optic of the patient himself. And that will give us a clear nomenclature and how to place those lenses for which patient instead of having this million names where you really don't know what is it today or how it is going to change tomorrow. Philomena. Yes, uh, just a quick uh, question. This, this kind of uh, rotational symmetrical IOLs, they are associated with uh, coma sometimes with the centration. Do you see that in your patients? Uh, usually when I implant and I always look, where is my Purkinje reflex? my third Purkinje reflex for the center. And I make sure that it doesn't go through the near segment. So you rotate the lens until you have the near segment beside it. And then you don't have this coma problem at all. Sometimes it doesn't work and then you have to re-rotate it again, like with a toric lens that's not uh, on the right axis. But that system usually works very well. I only had one case where it didn't work in a very hyperopic patient with a, uh, I think, a 30 diopter uh, hydrophilic lens where the near segment was always in the optical axis. And and we had to exchange it to a monofocal. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, okay. we're running out of time again. So uh, should we continue, uh, Thomas? Thank you very much. Uh, that was good. Thank you. Very good. Let's go to the last talk, right, uh, Oliver? Hamid, Dr. Hamid from the UK, he will talk about the 